Hello, I'm Max Soper. I'm a direct descendant of Colonel Richard Henderson, and I'm here at the home place called Benvenue Farms. And I would like to uh, kind of document the history of this place because I'm the last Soper that is living on the place, and probably upon my death, the place will be sold. So, uh, a few things I'd like to get people to know about the place. The story of the Soper Farm is closely tied to the story of Colonel Richard Henderson, an ancestor of the Sopers. Let me tell you about Richard Henderson. He was um, from Virginia and started a land company in 1775. Now, he was a land speculator, and even though the name of the company was the Richard Henderson Company, it was commonly referred to as the Transylvania Company. Well, Richard Henderson, in 1775, made a deal with the Cherokee Indians at Sycamore Shoals, Tennessee, called the Treaty of Watagua, where he purchased for $50,000 worth of trade goods and silver. He bought most of Kentucky and Tennessee from the Cherokees. Well, he sent uh, his Thomas Allen and Samuel Hopkins and James Hoag to petition the Virginia legislature to make this the 14th colony. There were some people that were in the Virginia Congress that uh, were kind of upset that they didn't get in on the land deal like Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson. So they wouldn't accept his proposal as being the 14th colony. And also they uh, voided the treaty he had made with the Cherokee Indians for the land purchase. But in recognition of what he had done in the helping settle this part of the country, the Virginia legislature granted the Richard Henderson Company 200,000 acres, which at the mouth of the Green River, which is most of Henderson County right now. Henderson County has a rich history. Part of that would be the Soper Farms. The farm dates back to the early days of Henderson, with Soper being one of the founders of Henderson County, along with um, Henderson and Hopkins. The farm is right, the only farm still standing that uh, gives some idea of what the history was like and what was taking place here. Tobacco was king, and the plantation reflects that. You have the original farmhouse, it was all built by hand, plus the outbuildings on that. Most of the farm is still intact, and it preserves what was here. Not only was it the, uh, one of the main tobacco farms of the area, but it was also the first winery, as well as other aspects of the early history here. As one of the last standing farms, uh, still intact of the early history, it, pre it preserves what is gone. The farm story is not limited strictly to the founding of Henderson County. It has affected many historic events and figures as well. William Soper was engaged in the freshwater pearls and mussel shells. He was the probably one of the largest producers of, of freshwater pearls and mussel shells in the world up until 1900. There's a, a sleeping loft over the part of the house where it was alleged that Audubon stayed there when he was out here doing his Birds of America book gathering samples and stuff. There's an old four-poster bed that was in the house, and uh, it won first prize for American craftsmanship at a World Furniture Expo in London in 1865. In 1925, Henry Ford came down and he tried to purchase that bed, and my dad wouldn't sell it. So he, he sent back home and he got some of his craftsmen and architects and they came down for two weeks and made drawings and measurements and things of that bed. So I'm kind of curious to know if they, they ever built anything, if they ever built one, or but they, they did try to make a copy of it. So uh, that was pretty interesting, I thought. It turns out craftsmanship runs in the Soper line. Max's preferred trade, knife making. Well today I'm going to be forging a small belt knife 
uh, using my coal forge here, I prefer doing things the old way. Uh, I have a gas forge if I need to up production, but I like doing everything without uh, modern conveniences. I'm using a piece of high carbon steel. This is 5160. There are all types of steel you can use for making a knife, but this one is more forgiving. And I started forging knives back in 1989 because I couldn't afford the fancy high dollar custom knives and you couldn't buy a good factory knife. So that's what piqued my interest in knife making. So we got the end of it red. I'm gonna beat a little bit on both sides to draw a point. Okay, so now I have a point. I can start figuring out my blade length and I'm gonna make it uh, about six inches long. So I'm trying to heat this up to about six inches and then I'll start drawing out the blade. Alrighty, now I'm gonna start my blade right about here and I'm gonna pound the same spot and draw the edge out. I'm going to flip it over and do the same thing on the other side. Now I'm going to start drawing the edge out the whole length of the blade. And as you notice when you do that, when you beat on the edge, the blade will start to curve upwards. Another heat and I'll refine the edge, make it look a little bit better. I'm going to work on the point a little more. Okay, so there we basically have the uh, blade done. Now I'm going to work on the handle and inch a blade this size ought to have a four and a half inch handle, roughly, by eye work. I, uh, the knives I make, there are no real measurements. I just, if I'm copying something, I do it by eye, unless someone specifies. So I'm heating up the, what's going to be the handle and cut it off. And this is a hot cutter. And I'll cut it off on the anvil. I don't like using power tools. Okay, I'm gonna cut this off about four inches. You wanna be careful flying hot pieces. Now I'll put it back in, heat it and draw it out and start shaping it. The secret to making a good knife is not to let the steel get too hot and to always experiment, always test your blades. Don't take it for granted because everything looks right and works right. About one out of every eight of mine I will take out and destroy. I'll bend them, I'll chop with them, I'll try and snap them in half, see what they'll do. I'm gonna draw this handle out, make it a little bit longer. Now the next step for me is to uh, take this up to my other shop and grind the lines true, grind the edge on it, and then the next step on that would be to harden and temper it. Now to harden it, I have to put the blade back in the forge and bring it up to the critical temperature. And the critical temperature of this type of steel is 1450 degrees. Well, unless you've been doing it for a long time, you can't tell how hot that is. And it's the non-magnetic stage. So uh, I keep a magnet when it's red and the magnet will no longer stick. Then it's the right temperature. I will take the edge. I have oil in this trough that I'll heat up to 140 degrees. I'll lay the blade in horizontally for about a half inch. I only want the oil to come up about a half inch on the blade. Now leave it in that position until the rest of the top of the blade turns black and all the heat's gone out of it. Then I'll drop the whole thing down in the oil. Now what that does, that'll harden 
the bottom half inch and leave the top soft. And you want the top soft so it'll make a, a knife that'll take a lot of abuse and flex and whatever. Now once it's hardened, you have to then draw back the temper because it'll be hard like a file. You could smack it on the anvil and it'll shatter like glass. So you have to take some of that hardness out of it. And to do that, you have to, I use an oven. You can stick it in the, in the fire until, uh, stick it in the oven at about 425 degrees for two hours. And that puts heat back in the blade, draws some of the hardness out of it. Take it out of the oven, let it sit, cool to room temperature, then back in the oven for another hour, then out, then back in for another hour. And then you finish it any way you want and you have a good, strong, tough knife. So, that's...